This is Tipping Point Radio, and you're listening to The 42 Show. Today we're talking about right and wrong, a subject many people may think is an easy topic to define. But what I came to find in this discussion is that it's a little more slippery as you throw in the values, morals, and ethics of not only yourself, but family, community, culture, religion, and politics, some of which may have opposing viewpoints on what is right and wrong. Well, today we try to sort it all out as three guys pursue the answers to life, the universe, and everything. Hello, everyone. I'm Craig Merriweather. I'm here with Brad Olson and Morgan Boatman. We're on the 42 show, and today we're talking about right and wrong, and that's all I know. <laughs> you usually have a big introduction, but I don't know what you want. It's your specific aspects of right and wrong. I don't have any specific aspects. I was just thinking about it last week about, well, how come there is a right and wrong? How come human beings are obsessed with this, with concept of right and wrong. Why is everything in our lives sort of tailored toward our behavior and our thoughts and our judgment of ourselves and others through strange filter, this uh, arbitrary filter of right and wrong. No other animal thinks about right and wrong. They just do. I mean, if you think about the difference between dogs and cats, a cat will get upset at you and scratch you in the eyeball and then be totally cool with it a second later. It doesn't have this lingering scar of guilt for doing something that it knows was the right thing to do at the moment. Why is it that humans have developed this this guideline to our existence that there should be something that's right and there should be something that's wrong? Our laws, our religions, our, our day-to-day behavior, the way we treat other people, what is moral? What well, is isn't, moral? isn't the reason we have laws and religions because we don't, we don't follow our inner knowing on what's right and wrong. We have to be told what's right and wrong. Some people apparently have to be told what's right and wrong. And, it, and some people it doesn't do any good. They mm-hmm. still wind up in prison or hell or wherever you want to wind up putting them. Why is it that there's, that we need a prison? Why is that such a, a huge part of modern society? Or a, of all societies? There's always some place where we put somebody that's done something wrong. Yeah, well they've hurt other people, they've caused either some sort of monetary damage or uh, God forbid some sort of physical damage to the person, maybe even killed them. And we, then we end up putting them in jail. Maybe we have the death penalty. And we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, and it doesn't seem to change anything. So on one hand, you're saying, well, if I go and I kill somebody as an individual, I should, I'm wrong, and I should go to jail. No, I didn't specifically but, say that, but I was just saying that's what we culturally do. culturally or socially, if, if my government sends me to go kill somebody, then I'm a hero. Well, that's a full-on different subject. Only if you kill many people, then you're a hero. If you kill one person, you're a murderer. If you kill many people, you're a hero. Well, no, he, he, you know, (laughs) you go into the army, you're getting a paycheck, you're getting your benefits, and they say, go shoot that guy over there because we don't like his government's politics. And so these two paid individuals are shooting each other for this backroom dealing that's going on. It's not necessarily paid, though. I mean, what if it's a revolution? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what if I, true. what if I'm a guerrilla and I, I'm a hero, a non-criminal in my own, uh, you know, community. A community, but you're a terrorist. Other look, look during the '80s, the uh, Sandinistas versus the Contras. It's like to some people that one was a hero, and to the uh, other people, just in our own country. So why yeah. is there right and wrong? I think it's an organizing idea of societies. I don't think there was right and wrong until we started living in groups. Mm. And then conflicting interests. You mean larger than... Larger than family units, let's say, or whatever caves we were living in, right? 
uh, however, however that was that we imagined those times. So, so Freud tells a little story about how, how we, we come up with these taboos, basically what's right and what's wrong. And the idea is you live, Freud said this is his, this is his sort of fantasy or myth, uh, where he said, in Totem and Taboo he writes about this, and, and uh, he says we, we lived in these small little tribal family, you know, associated groups. And so the, the alpha male was getting all the women. Mm. Mm. And his sons got together and killed him so they could have some women too. <laughs> Apparently it's all about sex all the time for us. <laughs> for Freud, for sure. And, and they felt such remorse and such shame and such mm. regret over the killing of the patriarch that these taboos against incest were established. And so you get this right and wrong idea developing. When, you're, when your behaviors start to affect larger numbers of people, then I, su I suppose um, this idea of right and wrong comes about. And, and frankly, you know, <laughs> being an ex-cop, uh, I see some value in, in right and wrong. I think that for people who aren't particularly psychologically, philosophically, or sufficiently self-aware, right and wrong is probably necessary. But there's a, there's a point where you reach a certain place in your own growth, in your own development, in your own understanding of, of self in the world, where right and wrong is really not a concept that has any bearing on your daily life. Well, people, people are okay as long as they're okay. But you start getting into the wishing and the wanting and seeing that your neighbor or maybe even another family member has more than you, that jealousy arises, same you know, with the father and the women. It's like, well, that's what I want. I don't have it. How can I get it? Or how can I take it from him? Because he's hoarding everything. And it comes down to if you were, it goes back to many of our other discussions, if you were content with your life, if you were happy with your life, then I, I think it's very easy to just do right, be happy, and follow the straight path. But if you're feel, you have feelings of um, unworthiness, if you don't think you, you're, you're not getting your just desserts, if you feel you deserve more than you're getting, you may feel that you're going to screw the man because he's taking and he's cheating, so why can't I cheat? That's the only way to get ahead. And people have been you know, the, the lower class uh, and the poverty stricken are, have been kept down, put down for so long. That's like, well, if those guys, and they see the Wall Street guys, they get away with a lot of stuff. You know, I don't, I can't think of more than maybe one or two people that got nailed for the whole 2007 economic debacle. And yet, if I go out and do that <laughs> same exact thing, if I start the insider trading and I start not paying dicking taxes, around and not paying taxes and, and dicking around with banking stuff, I'm in jail for 50 years. Yeah. You know, they had to do that to Madoff because the whole you, you screwed a bunch of rich people. Yeah, but it's know? hard and, to feel. And what is he? What is gin up sympathy for the people he screwed? Well, yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. And but see, if if but if you screwed because he screwed rich people, but if you screw the middle class, the lower class, and the poor, eh. So what? Well, that's really the big right and wrong in our culture today, right? Is the, the big right is that you have money. The wrong is that mm. you don't have money. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have money, you're screwed. And if you have money, um, you have all kinds of uh, power. Mm -hmm. So, right and wrong is, is an arbitrary... No, no, because we know they did wrong. It's just that... But if we there, know they did wrong and nothing happened to them... Right. Is There's, that well, wrong? Large, large the rules, that the rules, actually means it's right. Well, the largely rules. it's a social construction, as, as you're saying, Morgan. I think, I think that right and wrong... There, there's two kinds, right? There's, there's the kind of right and wrong that we know, uh, that we talk about in terms of morality, right? The, the moral imperatives that, that we feel that are, that are right and wrong. But, but the other kind of right and wrong that seems to operate at the level of a society, at the level of its laws and its institutions, isn't really based on any kind of moral imperative. It's based on power. No, I, I think they know it's right. What's right and wrong? They just do it anyway because they can get away with it. If you took but those it, guys, it, no, if, if you, you took get away with know. something, doesn't that mean that it's it means you're good at what you do? Doesn't and mean that it's means right. it's right. No, it doesn't. I bet you take any one of those guys aside, took them out, you know, 
by themselves without anyone else around, maybe have a nice bottle of whiskey there, a couple of drinks, and you ask them, is what you did right or wrong? I bet they admit that what they did was wrong and they know it. Well, I don't know. I mean, there was we're, we're, not, we're not talking about getting punished. I'm talking about because they're hurting other people. Do you guys... Do you and guys, they know it. No, I, don't think, I don't think that's necessarily true. Do, do you guys remember, like, last year there was a book published that, that made the claim that most CEOs of really big, you know, Fortune 500 companies are sociopaths? <laughs> Right. <laughs> it makes sense. I don't remember the book or the claim. But. Yeah, I, I can't remember yeah. the author or the name of the book, but but uh, it got a lot of attention when it was published, yeah. obviously. Now, Craig may not know what a sociopath is, so can you explain that? Oh, I'm a high-functioning sociopath. <laughs> a sociopath doesn't have concerns about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Seems mm -hmm. to be lacking that, whatever that psychic organ is that, that, that uh, uh, feels guilt. And it very well may be true. You read Steve Jobs' biography, you read the stuff about Bill Gates. Those guys were uber assholes. Just, you know, Steve Jobs would go around just screaming at people, berating people because they're working 80 hours a week. They don't see their families. Berates them because he has a deadline. And in technology, you have serious deadlines. And just screaming and berating people and belittling people to get what he wants. Same with Bill Gates. They had a whole thing when Paul Allen, co founder of Microsoft, got really sick. Uh, was having some hard times doing at work and he accidentally walked in on a discussion between Bill Gates and some other guy about how they were going to kick Paul Allen out. <laughs> Paul Allen started the company. It's his company. <laughs> yet they're finding ways to, to screw him. Same, um, look at uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and the whole Facebook thing. If you saw that movie, The Social Network. Now they screwed that one guy. Kept screwing that guy out of everything. He helped found the company. Right. And he wanted to take it in a different direction but he was still one of the founding parties and they were screwing them left and right. So what we learned from this is that our ideals of ethics anyways are designed by people who don't have ethics. <laughs> I don't think they design the ethics, they just ignore them. Well, I think that's an interesting point though because our ethics is morality just a way to keep people in line so this 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 wealthy, powerful few can do whatever the hell they want. Well, we no, look to those no, people as ideals, don't we? We go, oh, well, I want to be that guy. I want to be rich like that guy. But what are you always talking about? Oh, I need more money. I need more of this. Those guys are the ethicless guides of, of society. But people know that they have no morality and no ethics. And other than the nice we choices... We still have idolize them. But, but, you know, so this know. asshole that you were talking about, Bill Gates, yeah. is now the uh, probably one of the most philanthropic people in the world. I yes, just but, but he's also... Taxes. Yeah, and, and then even that's... You know, yes, I know he's doing a lot of good, but it's also, you know, he's trying to solve the food prob problems with genetically modified foods, and he's heavily invested in Monsanto. Well, so it's think, like, it, it's even that is quasi good. of, like... <laughs> really, dude, I, you had me for a while, and now you're even well, trying, to, trying to take over the world even more. And I ask this question sincerely because I don't know the answer to it. Do you think Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates were difficult personalities because they were, they were so committed to this idea, or was it that they were committed to making money? I don't know. Uh, you could probably say the same about Thomas Edison. I heard that, you know, oh, giant, I think it was a uh, giant dip. Destroyed Tesla. Yeah, destroyed Tesla and, and uh, would go out and electrocute elephants to prove that uh, Tesla's uh, electricity wasn't safe. And I, I don't know, who does that? Uh, I you think know? the and answer yet, to Brad's question is that they're one and the same. Because, back to your statement, power, if you have a passion, you get this energy from it. If it's translated into money, that's fine too, because that gives you more of what you're looking for. If you're a sociopath, you know, lightly defined, not like a, not a serial killer or something, right. You, you are, your, your main goal is to acquire, whether that's power or money or souls from people that you, uh, you know, <laughs> Don't approve of signing blood. Yeah, soul. <laughs> basically. I mean, from what you describe of Steve Jobs, he was 
taking people's soul to advance his his passion, his cause. Mm -hmm. um, and yet his passion and cause helped the world. Did it? What did we get out of it? Smartphones? We got Siri. Is that's <laughs> that, yeah, that really helped the world. <laughs> now guys don't have to ask for directions. <laughs> I think that's really so that's, helpful. That's even more so. Yeah, we can ask Siri. Siri has no memory. Look, there's um <laughs> <laughs> there was a doc, one of those uh, Doctors Without Border guys. He was in Africa doing some of his work, and he had a iPad with him to help him do something. And he was in his clinic, and there was a kid in there, a seven, eight year old kid. Kid uh, was illiterate, can't read, can't write, uh, no education. And this kid was just kind of mulling about, not doing much. So the guy hands him his iPad, just hands it to him, and then goes, back to do his stuff. The kid had it figured out in about five, six minutes and I was playing games on it. No instruction, the kid can't read or write. The, the power of what Steve Jobs has created since the 1980s and, and to certain, you know, Bill Gates too, is that he's giving knowledge to everybody. If you hand uh, that kid, it's like the $100 computer project. It's like you hand these people knowledge and the ability to educate themselves, then don't they get stronger? Don't they get more powerful? Because knowledge is power. Well, I, I think this is an, in, that's a really interesting story. I haven't heard that before, but I think that speaks to the power of image. You know, the iPad functions with this operating system, which is mostly image. It's iconic, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to that, it was all text-based. You had to, you know, type in your line of code and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's how long ago I was in an undergraduate, you know, you had to yeah, do all that, that kind of crap. And, and, and it was like absolutely not entertaining. And then, <laughs> and then when Mac comes along, yeah. oh, it's, now it's in images. Yeah. And the power of image to convey information is much more than the power of words. And this little kid in India is really demonstrating that. It, um, it was Ludwig Wittgenstein in, in the early 20th century he said that the boundaries of your world are defined by the limits of your language. Hmm. I think that's true. And when you add image into the equation, your language, your semiotic language, just explodes. The, the ability to, to convey more information in an image. You know, a picture is yeah. worth a thousand words, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I think, what's powerful about that. And yet we can misread the picture. I mean, that is a well, millisecond. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, that's Malcolm what, Gladwell talks that's about That's what religion this. does all the time. Malcolm Gladwell uh, has this uh, amazing, I think it's in his latest book, David and Goliath, where he talks about the civil rights movement and how uh, one of the things that pushed it over the top was this picture of a, a kid being attacked by a dog, uh, by, you know, the white police against a, a black kid. And he said the world was horrified, but if you really look at the picture, the kid's not afraid of the dog, the kid's kind of in command, and it's like, it's this misperception of what the picture was. And... Well, you bring your own bias. To right. That. And so, look, I, I think we're a little off track, but, but it's, it seems to me that, I think, on the inside, we have an inner knowing of what is right and what is wrong. And there may be sociopaths, there may be uh, there may be brain issues. Uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, who read some great uh, neuroscientist, uh, uh, read some great books, uh, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, and, and, and things like that, he has consulted on murder trials and done brain in, uh, scans of, of these mur kids who murder people or adults who murder people and say, look, their brain isn't working right. They got whacked on the head or they drank too much or whatever. Their brain is damaged. They can't think properly. Yes, they did wrong, but then you get into this weird issue of if you are a sociopath, there's something wrong with you. If you are, if you have some sort of brain damage due to an accident, or maybe your mother drank, or your mother uh, while you're in utero was was doing drugs or something, you have brain issues, and you can't think straight. So, I, I think you have to separate those people and look at the regular folk. So if there's something wrong with you, you're excluded there it is. from there it is. right and wrong. You can do what you like. What, what time are we at? We're 20 minutes in. <laughs> um, 
Is that what you're saying? I'm asking. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. No, not not specifically. Uh, you hurt other people. There there should be some repercussions to that. But the repercussions may not be. I, I don't know. How how is it helpful that Bernie Madoff is sitting in jail for 120 years? I mean, he screwed a lot of people. But if he has, if he's a sociopath and can't distinguish between right and wrong, I think the idea yeah. is you keep him, you separate him from the rest of innocent society so that he doesn't do it again. But what if you fix him? I think I think. What, what if you can do? go in there with because Dr. Daniel well, Amos what do you doing say? If, work. if there's someone who has a brain I'm problem, I'm not sure you can fix that. Well, if, if they have a, a brain problem. Oh no! It, just let him off because he didn't really kill that little person, that little kid. There was a guy. You should separate him too, man. There's a because he's even more likely to repeat it. Going back to Malcolm Gladwell, there was a guy in England who uh, he was a sleepwalker, and had terrible, terrible sleepwalking episodes because there was a problem in his brain. And one night he was having a nightmare. He thought some people had broken into his house and was killing his wife. This is what's happening within him. And so he starts attacking the attacker. Well, the attacker actually ended up being his wife, and he killed his wife. He got off because, I mean, he was devastated. I mean, what can you do to this guy? He just killed his wife, the, the love of his life, but it was not premeditated. It was an accident. He has this brain dysfunction. Yeah, but so what are you going to do? Give, he's a killer. And he could do it again. No, no, I'm not asking. to get him on. What, but what is so he doing? So society the right? is saying if you have an excuse, it's okay. No, I don't know. I don't. No, that's exactly just what society is doing. It's an object lesson in okay. Well, if you can explain yourself, it's okay. as as fathers, we go well. Okay, if you can tell me why you did that, why you burned the house down, then it's okay. Right. But in your model, then we should be seeing results of of since we're punishing people, putting them to death, sending them to jail for thirty years because they have five ounces of a pot in their pocket. We should be seeing a decrease in crime and antisocial behavior, and it's only made possibly even in increasing. I actually, I don't think that we should that we're going to see a then decrease what's the point? in antisocial behavior you just want to, by punishing. We are actually seeing just, a, a decline in, in, in <coughs> violent crime in this country across the board. Over the last twenty years, there's been a consistent decline in violent crime. They don't want us to know that. Maybe we should just buy Australia and send all our criminals over to Australia. <laughs> Do that whole system again. I think I think imprisoning people is a is a decidedly unimaginative way to deal with problems of human nature. I mean, we have laws, right? Because. Uh, because this is what people do. We have we have prohibitions against killing people because human beings kill each other. Yeah, but then the laws aren't aren't. Uh, Used fairly. Well, That's no, why we see more black men in prison than white men. Well, we, yeah. we, I, think, I think you make a valid point. I think we put a lot of people in prison who don't need to be in prison. I, I, you know, I don't think... You know, I, I mean, putting people who, who use drugs in prison for, you know, 20 years, that, mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense to me. Well, it doesn't. Well, there's, there's, just, there's two different standards. So somebody like Rush Limbaugh who gets caught with oxytocin and somebody else's prescription, he's, he's uh, out, uh, you know, his friends ask for prayers and for good thoughts to be sent his way. Yet if I was to be caught with oxytocin and somebody else's prescription trying to cross the border, I'm thrown in, thrown in jail, you know? Sylvester Stallone gets caught with uh, steroids trying to get into Thailand or whatever. He, they kind of look the other way and, and, and uh, let him in. Or throw, if, I, if I try to get steroids without permission into wow, Thailand, so I, what, what's going to happen to me? Sylvester Stallone and steroids. There's a well-kept story. <laughs> 65 and he still looks like he's 22. <laughs> But I'm just saying there, there's different standards. It was, yes, it was, because good and bad is not absolute. It is absolute. It's just that I, I think it would be fairly obvious. If we were to get a panel of people from all across the board, I think we could all agree that agree on what's How right. How about all across time? How about all across <laughs> cultures? Is there an absolute good and evil? I don't know. I, I, th I th think so. Right and wrong? No, I don't I think, think it's so. when you get in particular. So you, you look, uh, look at Pope Francis. He grew up in a situation down in Argentina where he sees the corruption of what's happening with, with money and uh, the just abject poverty that's down there. And so he brings to this European and somewhat American situation at the Vatican 
that he wants to help the poor people and he's being called a Marxist. You know, because he wants to, to a certain degree, make it a little fair. And yet, isn't that what the Christian religion is, you know, help those who are less fortunate than you. And, you know, a lot of the people raising their fists are saying, I don't want the government doing that. It's the church's responsibility. Then you get a pope who says, yeah, let's do that. And they're thinking, this guy's a Marxist. You know, and I think if you were to sit with Pope Francis and say, well, what's your deal? And say, well, here's my experience. Here's what I saw happen with uh, political corruption, economic corruption, and here's how I want to fix it. You'd probably not have an argument against him. Why didn't maybe, all the popes do that? Maybe because they're European. <laughs> you know, so. I mean, this is the first pope from outside outside of Europe in forever, if if not forever. You know, and even then, he's, his parents were Italian. You know, so he still has, and that's you know, he only got in there because the uh, you know there was this European contingency against the like this French German contingency against the Italian. Vatican contingency, and they couldn't decide. And he was just kind of like, let's get him. <laughs> you know? He's quote-unquote Italian because his parents are Italian, but yet he w he's really outside the system because he grew up in Argentina and has dealt with all that stuff, and he's a nice guy. And Do you think the College of Cardinals would elect somebody that's a complete wild card that they wouldn't know? They had to. I mean, they, they just... He was the only option. The French and Germans wanted their guy. The Italians wanted their guy. They, they would not budge. And after a couple weeks of this, they just like, forget it, let's get this guy. He, he's, he's, and this is, you know, this process of God choosing the new Pope. Is, it's, all, it's all politics and economics. Well, it and is, it is he's got to go in there and fix the Vatican Bank. He's got to fix the child abuse uh, issues. and It's a nightmare. And this is the, the house of God. And so even, and even then, I, I think if you were to sit down one of the cardinals, just take him out of the Vatican and say, look, here's the, what you guys are doing at the, bank of, the Vatican Bank. You're screwing people. You know, is that right or wrong? Say, well, yeah, maybe that's not so right. That's awesome that's that there's a bank in the Vatican. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The richest they man owners are, in the world. The, yeah, they, they, have, they are so incredibly wealthy. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy saying Pope John Paul I. Uh, back in, what was it, 1980, 1979. He only lasted three weeks before he mysteriously died. He was heavily, or a month or something, he was heavily looking into the uh, Vatican Bank. and all the So the pinnacle people. of goodness, uh -huh. according to our own standards, <laughs> is swarming with corruption. Well, evil. no, I mean, look at the history. It's, it's a political organization that was very much... I mean, they could so tell what? kings it's who could marry who they couldn't. It's still the pinnacle of goodness. I'm sure the Medici popes really had, yeah. you know, the milk of human kindness on their Well, mind. exactly. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> you read the history of the Vatican, it's, it's hilarious in its uh, sex, sexual uh, uh, dalliances and, and uh, the money issues and power issues and deciding which king can marry which queen. So if we can't look to the popes we for look, what is good and bad... Where do we look? Where do we find our well, own or our social good and bad? And I think this is, this is exactly the point. Um, I think you've got your finger on this. That we have to look to ourselves for what is right and wrong. And, and that takes an incredible amount of courage because we live in cultures where uh, the, the prevailing notion is often you're going to be told that that's wrong. But you have to be the own judge of, of what's right and wrong. Um, and you have to be willing to accept the consequences of, yeah. of uh, you know, living according to your own moral or ethical code. Which might be different than uh, your yes. surrounding society. Yes. I don't think so. I think it goes back to some basics. And I'll go back to the Boy Scout thing again. And they have that 12-step law. And I think it's one of the most brilliant, uh, simple, I mean, just the first few you know, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind. Not clean right? anymore? Well, clean's at the end. I was, I was doing all of them. That's like number 11 or something. But it, it's like... That was tried. added for those pedophile scout masters. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, God, man. <laughs> so, how does that help? My, my point. But there's uh, corruption there, too. There is yeah. corruption. But, it, but again, but they... <clears throat> you know, yeah, okay, the, the church, when, it, when you get that big... You're going to invite people 
who have uh, who are going to try and take advantage. Same with the church. I think the whole system is trying to take advantage. It's it's an idea of I know what's right for me, and therefore it's right for you guys. How can you say that? How can you go that far? As but soon as I say my right is your right, I'm wrong. I but how is that? How is that? How does that not work? Trustworthy, loyal. Doesn't that make sense? Why wouldn't you? How can you argue that? Well, yes, that, that, that is In a, today's time, in that situation... There in is, what situation? What are you loyal to? Friends? Family? God? Not I don't Hitler? Know. Right? I don't know. I didn't say Lo- government. Loyalty is, uh, is not a okay, characteristic. Loyalty to, a, to your values. Okay, cool. What if I'm a cannibal? <laughs> God! What? Well... It's the question. What is right and wrong? <laughs> okay, don't eat other people. That's wrong. <laughs> Why is that wrong? Their whole society is based on eating other people. This whole society is based on economic corruption. That doesn't make it right. When Catholic miss- missionaries went to the South Pacific and encountered these cannibal tribes and they exposed them to the ritual of the Mass, mm-hmm. you can bet those cannibals recognized that ritual. Yeah. Here, That's here's cool. a piece of our God. Eat it. <laughs> yeah. Here's his blood. Drink that. Okay. That That's doesn't make a sweet right. irony. I love that. <laughs> I do too. I really do. <laughs> oh, we're brothers. We understand. All right. So, trustworthy, loyal, cannibalistic, helpful, <laughs> friendly, courteous, kind, economic but, corruption. But don't eat your parents. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it comes down to. It's the fear of our own offspring. Maybe back to your yeah, story back to your Freud story. Because if you're if you're lazy, you want to gonna... control your son or daughter as they enter adulthood, and you want to lay down some laws so they don't eat you. <laughs> I think you're looking too. No, lazy. this is it. This is it. Because what happens in the in the lion's pride in the in the uh, the elk herd? There's a lot of fighting at that that transitional time. The the adult is trying to lay down the law. No, I'm still the boss here. Yeah, but this goes back to your cannibalism story. Look at what happens with the praying mantis. The man yeah. and woman have intercourse. Aren't you afraid the, of the your woman, wife sometimes? The head, head off of the guy. Yeah. So then cannibalism is right. Yeah. It can be under certain cir- circumstances. Under certain circumstances. Well, under certain circumstances, loyalty. Like the daughter right. party? <laughs> yeah. What was wrong with that? <laughs> they lived. <laughs> Some of them. Some, Some of them. them. Actually, I think the Donner Party weren't, weren't, weren't even the cannibals. They just wrote about it. I, I, don't, I don't think really they actually know, remember. I don't know the depths of this. I mean, it's such a punchline anymore in our culture. Yeah, I don't know the real story right. anymore. Well, it's like those... Um, it's like that was soccer, that the, team the soccer team. The soccer team, the chili soccer team. <laughs> yeah. <in> the <laughs> okay, isn't life good and death bad? Not necessarily. I don't think so. What if it's better afterwards? You're supposed to not think that. That deep, <laughs> deeply. <laughs> How do you know there's an afterwards? I don't. How do I know this isn't the afterwards? And we're in hell. Well, yeah. Talking to you two. <laughs> <laughs> week after week. That would be like the ninth circle of hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Craig. <laughs> the only the only thing that could be better is you'd be buried upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Smokes break over. Get on your heads. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, over the last 20 years or so, there's been some scientists out there who are looking at uh, the mathematics uh, and, and the physics of the universe and are saying it very well could be this whole situation that we are in, this reality that we see is a computer simulation. And the mathematics seems, I don't understand it, I just kind of read the articles, that, but they're saying that this whole thing, just like the Matrix, the movie, which is where the Matrix came from, these scientific articles, is that this is a computer simulation. And a simulation is a training process. Oh, that's for stupid. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah. it is. We're just, How is that? Because we're just seeing ourselves in, in nature. We, we always you think we're see. something separate from nature. Oh, it's, a, it's amazing that there's a circular cloud or a... Or a or a, you know, there's a square on the in just the dirt. You, just because we recognize our own our own limited view of nature doesn't mean that there's a computer running our lives or 
But, but, I'm curious. but does it mean it, it isn't either? Does you, can, you can ridicule it all you want. But if we've set this, if we set somebody or us as spiritual beings to set up a system for us to train, just like a flight simulator. So we're in training here in this, in this notion? Maybe this is what your life is all about. But what does that make us, though? Aren't we then simulated by the computer, too? I mean, because we're the unless, same. Unless you're the pilot. We're the same matter as this. Inhabited by what? So you just said earlier that we are different than the animals. How so? If we are the pilot and we are sitting in a, uh, well, a computer simulation to learn something that we need on the other side. We apparently have, side. We have a variation of consciousness other animals don't seem to have. Yeah. Um, we have the ability to be exactly. self-aware and with the exception of dolphins maybe and you know, maybe one or two other species, they don't seem to have the same kind of self-awareness that we do. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at, again, going back to science, if we're looking at vertical time, instead of a, a forward time, the future, and a backwards time, the past, if it's all vertical, and there are 25 dimensions, why couldn't this be a possibility? It's just another excuse to find a God that, no, it's an, that it's, gives you purpose. That's, that's, but what, that's the God, but what if the God is you? I didn't oh. say there's another being. I'm saying, what if it's you? It, it's an excuse well, to find a purpose. So wait, wait, let me, I'm really having a hard time understanding this. It, so we've created the simulation, mm -hmm. and then we sort of insert our mm -hmm. personalities or, or psychology into the. I mean, you could take it that far. I mean, it, yeah. And so then we watch ourselves behave, and, and, and possibly. We I mean, that those are you know theories, according to the scientists who do the fancy math, seems to be accurate. But to why a bother? Point. I don't know. Why would you ask me that? And we could spend the next. Well, you brought it up because it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. Sure this it could explain the entire universe. How is the explanation of the entire universe irrelevant? It's completely irrelevant. The explanation doesn't matter. It's, it, 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 it's it shows the living you. Of it that no, because this explains your whole purpose of being. If you were here to learn something, wouldn't that change your, your outlook of life? No, Maybe not yours, I but. You it already. Right. But so if you're I, already there. You're, you just got a bad knew, attitude. If about I it. knew that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew that for sure, wouldn't right and wrong just go out the window? Because this is a simulation. I could do whatever I want. I can I crash want. the plane yeah. as many times as I want. But be, why would you do that? We talked about that before. Why would you do that? Day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because well, it's fun to crash that? planes. But it's like it's Groundhog's Day. How many times are you going to do that until you finally figure out what the message is? I don't know. Let me try. But what's the point of that? Can't you have fun doing other things? But what's the point of finding the, the reason to exist if you're, if you're not what's existing? What's the point of finding the meaning of, of all things? Is this... But you're, you're... Okay, your meaning of life that you just yeah. said is that my life is meaningless. No, your life is... is... That I'm driving in a, in a simulation. That is, that's the essence of meaningless. Meaningless? You created this entire thing so that you can learn something and you find that meaningless? Yeah. Oh. Driving a simulator. There has to be something worth... Yes, the knowledge Didn't that you're you... learning being here. It, you know, if you think getting it right is the point of life, then that's just... Stupid. Okay, what's the point of life? <laughs> Getting it wrong, just wow. doing it. Well, that's an. That but how is our how is our two explanations different? I'm because saying just you're doing waiting. it right. You're no, saying no, no, you're, you're, get it wrong. You're waiting. Okay, is this right? Is this? I, I can't live until I learn how to live. Yeah, but you're saying you're shrugging I'm your shoulders and just chuck live. It. And you're saying just screw, shrug, shrug your shoulders and say fuck it. Oh well. There, I just did it. <laughs> yeah, he's shrugging his shoulders, ladies and gentlemen. We're done. Because video games suck. What? That's why. Because you're learning how to play the video game. You're not learning how to live. But that's the point of the simulation, to learn how to live, to learn how to love, to learn how to matter. How about you just do it? That's the point. Are we not talking the same thing? I, 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 am I not making myself clear? No. Because it seems like we're, we're talking the same thing. We're just, think, no, if you're sitting in the simulator, you're not flying. If you're flying, then you're flying. I don't know. There's a, there's an interesting question, Cause, and that's not <laughs> right that's now. not that's not really entirely correct. You can you can uh, attach people to a PET scan, and that's the that's the, like the brain thing that stuff. shows the brain lighting up. You know mm -hmm. the, the PET scan, and you can have them say swing a golf club and hit a golf ball. 
Good. And watch their brain light up. And you can have them imagine hitting a golf ball. And their brain lights up the same way. The exact same way. So the brain has the experience whether you do it or not. Mm -hmm. Which... Can't speaks, tell the difference between a... Uh, speaks to your idea of... Uh, Unless your brain is simulated. <laughs> I haven't heard you, you make a, a, a reason why this doesn't exist or is helpful. You're just annoyed by it. But that doesn't make it not true. Well, I mean, this, this gives people Yeah, you're sitting in front of me, too. But, so, so let's say that it is... More annoyed at you and you disappear? <laughs> let's say it is annoyed true. Annoyed at you because you're not understanding. Let's say it is true because I think that annoyed has implications myself. for our ideas of right and wrong. Would you have to build in then to the simulation the lack of awareness of the simulation or the inability to apprehend the simulation? I don't know. Maybe maybe we all have our own personal simulations. If we have multiple uh, universes, you know, there could be a, a Craig who is living in in uh, Africa. There could be uh, you know so many different opportunities for me to learn something specific, and maybe I'm creating all this just so I can learn something. But you what does are, that matter? You're not going to learn anything unless you're totally immersed. And if you're thinking about... But maybe I am. It's like, it's like dream analysis. It's like, like if I wake up in the morning and I go, wow, what did that dream do? Careful now. And I know, <laughs> who are you talking to? This is my living you're talking okay. about. <laughs> and I spend the next hour thinking about the, the few little fragments of dreams that I remember. That's an hour that I didn't use... Live it. Okay. So if I'm sitting here but in what the if, simulation what if the dream is going, oh wow, this is only a simulation. I'm supposed to be learning something here. <laughs> but what if it's a message, trying to get get you a message somehow, some way, and you ignore it because hey, there's something better on TV. I'm not saying to ignore it because there's something better on TV. I'm saying incorporate it, but don't obsess about it. That, that's. That's a fine line. Your obsession may no, be me just being opposites. interested in trying to f figure it out. I don't know. I see both ends of this. I mean, I, I mean, do you I just like at 20 minutes say, well, I almost had a dream figured out, but I don't want to obsess. I think it's most You're important. You're going to figure out a dream, Craig? Oh, well. Some people. <laughs> <laughs> now it's your turn. Kicking my ass here. <laughs> well, if you can figure out dreams, let me hear about it. I, but, but this is, you know, I kind of land in the middle uh, with this, because I think you're right. The, the idea should always be to live. That's, that's the first obligation to ourselves, I think. But I also think that one of the things that makes living interesting is speculating about the nature of life. And, and I don't see that necessarily as detracting from the living. They may be the same thing. How, isn't living to grow and to learn and to gain knowledge? Living just isn't getting on a helicopter and skiing down a mountain that hasn't been skied before. Or, you know, what's the guy that's going to jump off Mount Everest with his, you know, flying squirrel suit? You know, what, what an adventurer. Don't what, you what think he hero. learned something, though? How do you I do know. that? I think he's doing it in a couple months. Is he going to have the camera thing? Yeah, probably. So we can watch that? That cares. Or, you know, the guy, the guy who uh, <laughs> jumped from the stratosphere. You know, that's kind of cool. And maybe they learned some scientific nonsense of how one pre call On one but, hand, you call... Knowledge and learning nonsense, and on the other hand, you think it's the only reason you're here. It seems to me that you're saying he should just jump out of the plane to live life and not jump out of the plane to learn something. But you can't live without learning, you can't learn without living. Isn't that what I just said? They were like, Well, I agree. I, I agree. Think, no, you don't agree. I, I, you're I really don't think you guys are that far apart. I really don't. Oh, I do. I think, I think, I think, I think you're, he's understanding. I think I'm you're saying. in the same ballpark you just done different sides of the field or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the football field, I'm on the baseball field. <laughs> to me, life is boring and uninteresting and not life if I'm not learning something. Here I am, 46, I'm going to be 47 pretty soon, and I got this stack of stuff I want to learn. And a lot of it's about spirituality and my inner being and things like that. So you're going to read some books? Read books, go to workshops, Meditate, pray, look at my dreams. Uh, and then you're gonna die. Talk to you, I guess. I don't know. You're gonna have your head. Full Maybe of I'm stuff. not gonna die. Maybe I'm going to be born into, you know, the level that I needed to attain. 
I mean, maybe it really is a, a, like a computer game, and it's like if I pass this level, like the Buddhists say, then I, and I graduate up to another level, and then I learn something new. And maybe the, I'm creating all of this. So you remember what you learned last time? No, I don't know. But maybe. Maybe I'm using it. Maybe what I learned last time has allowed me to create this world. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm fascinated by the concept. And to me, that, that makes it life interesting. Otherwise, I would have taken myself out a long time ago. This is, you know, can be, life can be kind of boring and stressful, and what's the point? So as long as it's a simulation and mm -hmm. you're learning, you're okay with it. Mm -hmm. But if it's a... If it's real and it's a dead end, I didn't say it wasn't real. I mean, simulation I, by nature is unreal. But it's real to me in this moment. Then and I still what does it matter to, if it's a simulation? It it gives it a depth that reminds me of who I am and what I'm here to achieve. Brad said the your brain is stimulated whether it's real or not. The brain, but who's talking about the brain? I'm talking about the soul. Is your soul uh, stimulated by simulation or by I guess, I realness? Don't you just you said earlier that we have a consciousness different than the animals of the earth. Wouldn't that make that the soul? They all have brains that can be stimulated. I can stimulate, you know, our scientists can stimulate the the rat's brain or the mouse's brain because it's so similar. That's a, similar to us. That's a third century know. debate about whether or not animals have souls. You know, but then you look. Well, you look at the dolphins. You mentioned the dolphins. Maybe the dolphins, you know, like that Star Trek movie. Maybe the dolphins and the whales are a higher consciousness than us. There's many stories of dolphins coming to the aid of, aid of people. That's of probably why whales sound so depressed all the time. Look, you know, you got whales in. in <laughs> well, yeah, you're crapping in their home. If I came over to your house and took a big dump, wouldn't you make you sad? No, it would make your wife sad, though. Yeah, we, we wouldn't care. We wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't, we care. wouldn't, wouldn't care. care. <laughs> your wife would. But look, you got whales who are, who are communicating with other whales. You know, whales in Alaska communicating to whales in the Caribbean, 5,000 miles away, just through vibration. I mean, there's this, we have birds who fly 2,000 miles when they're migrating. Most of the time they're asleep, and yet they make it. We have butterflies three generations four or five <clears throat> generations apart who know exactly where to migrate to you know the exact same places are they and all simulated a, they very well could be i could be just making that up because of what what i need to learn Whoa. i mean you you could be and you could be having your own simulation somewhere else you're just using you're just helping me out because you're a pal and a mm. friend and you're kind and you're courteous <laughs> and you're loyal it's, and you're it, friendly Becoming more and more important. So, your reverent, deep respect. So what would what would what would redeem the simulation? Because it seems to me if it's a simulation, it's very easy to become nihilistic about life and say that's just, what I'm feeling. It just right. doesn't matter. So what redeems? But that's, that's, that's but maybe that's the point. I mean, once you learn how to not be nihilistic and start helping, I mean, we we've been given these clues along the way, and the clues oftentimes get corrupted. You know, look at, read the uh, ancient texts. You do all the time. You read this stuff. And sure, once a bunch of powerful, greedy people get a hold of it, then they mm -hmm. switch it into power and greed and, and money and what they can get for themselves. But you read the, the ancient teachings, and it's fairly similar to what modern science is saying about stuff. You know, listen to the work of Greg Braden. G-R-E-G-G uh, -G -G Braden. He, the man's amazing. He's been studying this stuff for 40 years. A scientist who started looking at these ancient texts and say, man, that's kind of paralleling what we're saying now with science. And maybe those two things aren't so far apart, spirituality and science. Well, religion and science uh, historically have been very close. I mean, and they went their separate ways probably in the Middle Ages. Well, it comes back to power. Yeah. If, if I, with the uh, voice of God in my ear, say that but uh, the also, sun revolves around the earth and somebody else says, yeah, it seems like that's not the case. But it's also a refusal to, I mean, I mean, and, and I think this is a relevant issue. Uh, that divergence is, is really based on a refusal by a religion to acknowledge the realities of the, of the modern world. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is still a kind of a Bronze Age way of thinking about the world. But you have no choice. Their book states that this is the way things should be. It's, it's amazing we still don't do animal sacrifices. And, uh, you, you know, 
Why? Well, because it's wrong? The Bible says it's okay. God says it's okay, at least the God of the Old Testament. You know, everybody points out that homosexuality is wrong, and they point to Leviticus. Well, Leviticus also, in God's law, says no pork, no tattoos. Yeah. I don't see anybody picking it out the tattoo you, parlors. You this is God's law. You can't mix fabrics no. either. And you're sitting there ch chomping with your, your I love God tattoo, chomping on a piece of bacon and telling me homosexuality is wrong. It's like, I don't see you outside a tattoo parlor to pick it in. Well, we're, we're finally back on, on the course here, right and wrong. All he left so, out was the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Thou shalt not live in the trailer. <laughs> At least on blocks. So right and wrong. The Bible says those things are wrong. But now they're deemed okay. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't remember Paul or, or uh, Peter or uh, John or James or any of them saying that getting a tattoo was God's, God's will now that Jesus died for our sins or that you can just start eating pork. That was a Jewish thing. Or and now that we're all Gentiles you know, or that Paul went to the Gentiles and started... Uh, Talking in, in Greece and, and, uh, and this word spread. Right, and wrong is arbitrary. It's according to uh, who wants but that, something out of it. That's more of a cultural thing, you know. And that, that's just a mamby pamby law. It's like you know, I, I mamby pamby. Now you're calling careful. Don't eat pork, mamby pamby. And Care, maybe maybe careful, it was a careful to whom you call the Bible mamby pamby. Well, I know. Well, I got you as my friend. You'll protect me. <laughs> or will you? You won't. <laughs> You'll watch and then <laughs> come to my aid. <laughs> Look, it is, it's, it's, it's arbitrary. At one point, you can't eat bacon. Now you can't eat bacon. Unless yeah. you're Jewish, and then you can't eat bacon. Again, the pinnacle of what we look to for right and wrong is... But that has nothing to do flexible. with right and wrong. What, right and wrong is... The Bible purports to be the document of right and wrong. <laughs> People aren't following it. Uh, religious people have tattoos and eat bacon to Sunday morning. Don't follow the Sabbath on Saturday. So that's my point. I don't know. I think I think it is right and wrong uh, is always subject to the spirit of the time, and it's always. But again, seen that's, that's, that that's cultural things. But we're, we're so talking about. But you right can't wrong. live outside of your culture. This is this is one of the things you. you but again, it's, it's arbitrary, and, and over time, I think there are some basic tenets, like the Scout Law, I keep going back to that, that say, yeah. Don't get a tattoo. It says nothing about that. That's why it's arbitrary. Be clean, but that, again, it is, it's a little vague, because what does, what does loyalty mean? We, you know, we mentioned that. Are you talking loyalty to your government, and to Hitler, and Mussolini, and Paul Pot, and, or are you loyal to your own values? Are you loyal to your friends, your family? What if your family's a bunch of assholes? Well, if, you're, well, if your dad's uh, uh, Madoff or your dad is Hitler, or, you know, we have some issues here we, we are in Arizona. There's some issues with uh, the senator and his, his son. No, but if your dad uh, is Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still stuck on that one. <laughs> God, I go home from school. Hey, Dad, I'm home. <laughs> there's a, actually, there's a movie... Uh, it, and it's amazing. It's an amazing movie. It's called Hitler's Children. And it's a documentary film about uh, children of high-ranking Nazi officials. Oh, wow. it's, it's an amazing film. I watched the one about Hitler's secretary. And um, it's this woman. She was a typist in the bunker. And she was just picked. It's just like, you come. You know, she's in the pool at, at the army base or whatever. And says, you come. And she's in the freaking bunker in the last three months or four months and she never zipped her lip I think she was in jail for a little bit after the war and didn't say anything I think she passed away like three or four months after the movie was made never mentioned her story but you know again it goes back to that loyalty thing are you going to you know get thrown in the concentration camps or, or are you going to so do you think know? there were people who liked Hitler I mean like I mean, so I don't know, like John Wayne the... Gacy got arrested, you know, he was burying people under his porch and stuff. Oh, and, right. And he, he gets arrested and, and the neighbors say, well, what do you think about this, the, you know, the news people? Say, and, oh, you know, he was a quiet guy. He yeah. was never, you know, he was You're a good neighbor. Like was, do you think... But he didn't come up with all that stuff. But he didn't, <laughs> he didn't come up with all that stuff. It was he had a wife. Of him. Yeah, well, his mistress, well, his wife three hours before he killed himself, but he... he that was a group of them. It wasn't just him. You know, same, same with, you know, everybody points to maybe at another politician in America. You know, 
you want to look at Reagan or Clinton or Bush or whoever. Well, yeah, like Steve it wasn't, Jobs it wasn't, didn't actually invent anything either. No, it was he had him, an idea. Well, it's him and Wozniak, but Wozniak was an engineer who invented the stuff, and Steve Jobs had the balls to yell at people and and get it done. Get there's, business there's done. There's Hitler in a nutshell. <laughs> but you know, if you if it was a it was all of them. That's that's why they had the Nuremberg trials to, to go after these guys, yeah. and it be it becomes a power thing. You know. I find it fascinating. I mean, I mean why does, what's in it for them? Why does Hitler become Hitler in our popular cultural imagination? I mean, that's like the worst thing you can say about somebody. You know how right. internet conversations mm -hmm. deteriorate and eventually somebody calls you a Nazi. Nazi, right. <laughs> but Mao killed, oh. you know, 20 times as many people as Stalin, who killed twice as many people three times as many people as Hitler. Well, I think that comes down to uh, cultural ignorance on our part as Americans. Uh, maybe in Europe, the, you know, I'm sure the Germans don't call each other Nazis any. They call them Stalinites or, you know, communists or Rus Ruskies or something. You know, in, in uh, Cambodia, maybe they, they do say, you know, man, you guys, you're acting just like a Pol Pot. Whereas in America, I don't think we, under, we, under, we even know who Stalin is. Or let alone Mussolini well, we never or, fought or Stalin either. Stalin I mean, was on our side for a while, you know. And then I, I just think we just don't understand. We're not taught. We're not trained. Uh, you know, whereas Europeans, and that was way over there, somewhere else. Maybe people in Europe are are listening to this, and and they probably have a better idea of what went on in their very own country not that long ago, where their fathers and grandfathers fought and their homes were destroyed and there's still towns that are probably World War II rife with World War II destruction. I, I just think we, we call people Nazis because that's the only thing we can grasp onto. And you know, it's like why we call everything... The Third Reich was very image oriented. It was very, very so. hugely. It, it, it was very charismatic and that's getting back to uh, your group idea that at some point Somebody had to say, what we're doing is right. And a bunch of people got on board with that. Well, okay, this is right. This is not wrong. So I can, I can do it. Even though we look at it today, or our image of it, and say, this is the epitome of wrong. It turned 180 degrees mm -hmm. from being but they're, they're absolutely so right to being absolutely the worst thing you can think yeah, of. Yeah, but it's, it was, there's so much economic distress that it... And then you get some sociopaths in power who find a, a mouth who can go out there and you know have that charisma you know lots of lots of people who rise to power have that charisma and Hitler obviously did I don't think he was in a bubble by himself coming up with all this stuff I think he had that you know panel committee whatever you want to call it around him well, coming up with the stuff like and little by little an individual but I think they you know it's like that game uh, that card game hurts they started look we're doing this let's shoot the moon we got Poland what else can we grab? Well, there's the added incentive that if you don't agree with us, we'll kill you. Well, there's the added incentive. You know, look, the, um, the Belgians let them in. They voted him in. He didn't, like, have to take over Belgium like Poland. They, they held elections, and he says, look, we're going to come in, and you're all going to have jobs, and you're all going to get paid this much, and you're going to have health care, and we're going to fix the economy, and all you got to do is... Sounds familiar, does it? Yeah, all you have to do is, is let your, your our people into power... And they did that, and eight months, nine months later, they regretted it, you know. So it was just, you say the right things. When you're hurting that bad, when you're wondering tomorrow where you're going to get food, you're not thinking nine months down a road if this is going to be good for you or not. Well, isn't that what's inspiring Tea Party politics in this country? Uh, boy, that's a whole other thing. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. How do you I, mean, I, Brad? What do you mean by that? You know, the economic crisis and this feeling of powerlessness and uh, a rise, you know, up arises these very charismatic uh, leaders who say things people want to hear and who seem to be really cynical about it. Mm. I think politics is nothing more than divining what we think we want to hear and then saying it. Yeah. So well, then I, think I, don't, I don't think the Tea Party or the Republican Party or the Democratic Party have any any objective other than that. Look, their, their job is to remain in power. Power equals money, blah, blah, blah. So it's in the, the party in power 
be a Democrat, Republican, it is in their best interest to tell you what you want to hear. It's in the best interest of the party that's not in power at the moment to make sure this country doesn't work. Because then election time to say, hey, this country doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work for you. It works for them. It continues to work for them. They can't take one, they can't destroy their system because that's their job, like you said. And they can mess us up. So Madoff's real crime was that he thought too small. Who's? Madoff. Oh, Madoff. I mean, what you're saying is that this is what our government's doing. It's running the same kind of pyramid scheme well, that, that it, Bernie Madoff. You know, there, there's a book that just came out, and uh, it's called Flash Boys. It's by the guy who did Moneyball, and he's talking about how they are, the, the corruption in the, and I won't go into it, but the corruption of the stock market. And the corruption of the stock market happened right around 2008. I mean, again, this new way of them doing it. It's a high stakes, high speed uh, grabbing of stocks. And we're talking nanoseconds. So, and it's basically the length of the wire from the computer at <laughs> as the, the electrons travel yeah. through it. Yeah. Wow. So it's basically if if my desk is closer to oh. the the server at the Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange or whatever, if I have a ten foot cord and you Morgan have a twelve foot cord and Brad has a fourteen foot cord, I'm going to get the information three nanoseconds sooner, and my computer can flip the deal before you can. Oh my gosh. And so it's all about, and so it's this high stakes thing that now, that started in 2008, and took some guy, some guy couldn't figure out why he would press his button to buy a stock for $20 a share, and all of a sudden, two seconds later, he was, once the transaction completed, he, he bought it for $20.03. Uh. And he couldn't figure out why that was happening, it was because Somebody saw that he was about to buy it, so they bought it all and then sold it back to him all within like, <laughs> like you know, 0 0.03 seconds. All invisibly. Yeah, and it took him 18 months to figure out what was going on. He looked into it and he was t showing the banks, so look, this is what's going on. And, and talk about values and morals, he's now set up his own stock exchange that doesn't do that kind of stuff. That's supposedly not corrupt. And, and he's getting lots of business from these banks who says, yeah, we don't want the corruption, but again, they're kind of allowing this stuff. The stock exchange makes their money by renting space close to their server. And the closer to your, the server, the more money you're going to make, even if it's just cents on a stock. Mm -hmm. You do a million stocks a day, you're making a lot of money uh, just by that, that access. And there's a guy who dug a tunnel from <laughs> uh, Chicago to New York, dug a tunnel and uh, as, as a crow flies, and he spent something like $200 million building this tunnel, and, and so that the optic fibers from Chicago to New York, or New Jersey, wherever it went, now run faster than what AT&T was doing because it did all this zigzagging thing. Ah, right. And if they can get there, and let's say AT&T could get from Chicago to New Jersey in 14 nanoseconds, <laughs> this guy gets there in 10 nanoseconds, and he charges $10 million a year for access to his lines. And they'll pay it because they now have, the, the, they get there first. So, no, you know, right and wrong doesn't get into that because are there, are there rules about Yeah, they, being well now the FBI is looking into it, the, the Securities Exchange Commission is looking into it, the Justice Department is looking into it, but this happened in 2008, they started doing this, right after the full collapse of the world economy. These people got, you know, dusted themselves off and say, hey, what if we got the information two nanoseconds faster because of our processor speed of the computers, we can now do So that. what are you saying? I don't know. So we don't have, we don't happen. It's, it I goes think, back to the sociopaths. Yeah, I, I, don't think, mm. I don't think we necessarily have discussions about right or wrong when it comes to technology, do we? I no, mean, I'm not yeah. hearing them. Well, you know, and, it goes back to drone planes and, and uh, national security agencies spying on people and listening to our phone but, calls. But even at the level of development, I mean, we seem to think that because we can do it, we should. And there doesn't seem to be discussions about whether or not we should do this mm -hmm. at that level of, you know, developing technology. So we can clone, you know, and, and more and more things are being cloned now all the time. They found some seeds in Israel that were, you know, 2,500 years old, and now they've got a plant that has been extinct for 1,500 years. Should we be doing that? Yeah, is there any... Uh, I mean, it goes back to this, this stem cell that? research. Should we be doing that? And it goes back to, well, what's it going to be used for? Are you going to use it to help people? 
are you harming others in your gathering of the stem cells or are you going to create superhuman soldiers to go out and massacre other people? It goes back to right and wrong. You know, is there a right way to use this technology and is there a wrong way? And we who see, gets to decide that? We see that? technology as sort of a resource that we can, that should be exploited. Mm -hmm. And without more technology, we're going to run out of things to do. We're going to, we see that technology is our manifest destiny. It's not examined very carefully. I, I think well, that's I think, true. I think if you, you throw, I try and... Yeah, that so, idea of manifest destiny is a, it's a powerful one in our culture. It well, is. I, I try to throw everything through the filter of the, the scout law. And, and some days I, I'm very good at that and other days I, I fail miserably. But I look at what I do and I look at what other people do and I say, well, can you say that's kind, helpful, friendly? Can you say that, uh, can I trust you? Uh, are you being loyal to whatever, are you being reverent? If not, then I say, and then it's wrong. If, it, if you can put it through that filter and say, yeah, that, that works, that's good, then it, it's right. And so you have great. guidelines that you understand and that you have defined mm -hmm. and that you use. Well, I haven't um, defined them. That was created 105 no, years ago. No, when you we did define them. When you Powell have put to, together you the You have to decide what they mean to you, though. Yeah. Like the loyalty question. You know what loyalty means to you and how far you would go with loyalty, for instance, to some exterior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it goes party. together. Okay, yes, I can be loyal to, to you. Let's say you come to me and say, hey, uh, that Brad has a really nice car, and uh, we're going to take that and uh, take a joy ride down to Phoenix, and I'm loyal to you because you're my friend, but that's not being very kind or, or friendly uh, or, or reverent to Brad. That's what we're saying. And it's not trustworthy. So it's like, yeah, you, it has to go through that full filter. You have guidelines. And, yeah. I, and I usually when I tell the scouts, I say, you know, break it down to, to three. Are you being helpful, friendly, and kind? And if you're not, and you can usually just judge by those three, if you're not being kind, then you pretty much don't do it. What if somebody broke in right now and held, held you at gunpoint? Should I be kind to them? Well, Should I help After you kick them in the balls and <laughs> break their arm. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's, I, don't think, I don't think it's very movable, though. You know, um, I, would I be, am I being kind and, and reverent to myself by letting him take over my home and, and hurt my family? Am I being loyal to my family? Am I being kind to my family by letting him just ransack my house? Again, it goes through, it goes through that filter. But if somebody else is doing obvious wrong by coming into my house with a gun and demanding all my money, and that, that's wrong. On the other hand, what if his you know, family's starving? What if his kid needs medical attention and the insurance won't deal with it anymore? Should he be thrown in prison because he's hungry? Because his family's hungry? What if he's being loyal to his family? He needs to feed his family. You know, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a tricky line. It is. That's what makes it so fascinating. Yeah. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought it up. I, when you first mentioned it, I thought, well, that seems kind of big and and, and vague. But um, it, it's it's hard. It's a hard one. You know, if if I'm in a, in a car accident, you know, if I'm driving down the street and a police car going 80 without a siren or lights on rams into me and I get a brain injury and the next year I, in, in a fit of anger because of my brain injury, hurt somebody very badly in a fight, am I responsible for that? Or is the know? policeman that injured you? Do I sue the policeman? Do I sue the police department? Do I, you know... Well, it's, it's, it's a I mean, that, it gets ridiculous, and, and that's one of the real difficulties I think with uh, with criminal codes and legal systems in general, because they require you know if you're going to be convicted of a crime, they require you first of all to be competent, mentally competent. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they require you to have intent to commit the crime. Mm -hmm. Somebody like that doesn't have intent necessarily. But it comes down to your, your lawyer. Do you have a good lawyer? Look at all the people who are releasing off death row because of uh, DNA evidence proves they didn't do it. Look at those kids, the West Memphis Three kids, who were in jail for 18, 19 years. One of them on death row getting his ass kicked by the guards every couple of days for a crime he didn't do. Mm. That was pretty obvious from the start that he didn't do it or they didn't do it. And yet, because of politics and just an awful situation in which they needed somebody and let's pick on the outsider who wears black and listens to Metallica and let's get the quasi-mentally retarded kid to make a confession where he gets most of the details wrong 
uh, after a 12-hour interrogation without a lawyer or his parents present, and they base it all on this. And after a while, after you know, one time it's like, okay, maybe they made a mistake, but you see this over and over and over again, and after a while it's like, this can't be an accident anymore. Well, it's know? not. Justice doesn't really exist. And, and we persist in insisting that it does. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. as individuals and as communities and as species, we strive toward right. We have a feeling that we want to get where we want to go by being right, by either having the favor of our gods or the working within a natural system where we don't feel like we're cheating, we, don't, we feel like we're not hurting people, we feel like we're being fair and just and clean. But things get complicated because we want things that are sometimes outside of our abilities and skills and fortune. Our, our sense of right is ultimately found within us and can get skewed sometimes. If right, or, or if my, my uh, actions will benefit my family but hurt your family, then my rightness kind of shifts over in that direction. If my rightness benefits me directly but hurts you a little bit, but doesn't hurt you enough and benefits me enough, then again, my rightness is, is, is flexible. In general, persistence of life is perceived as right and death is wrong, but those are wildly manipulating, uh, able to be manipulated in my heart and head. So we've come up with, collectively, we've come up with a, a sort of general right and wrong. My church says that one thing is right and wrong. My government says different things are right and wrong. My grandmother said that she had to do these things, and those are different right and wrongs. And we, we bring all those values into our system, and we, we, try to, we still try to strive for walking a right path, uh, even sociopaths. Oh, path and path. That's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, well, I think you bring up a really But interesting there is point. no right and wrong. And there well, hasn't been over time and over culture. But we still strive for what that concept may mean to us individually. Yeah. Well, think, you, well you bring that's up... the obligation we have is to wrestle with that idea. What is right and wrong? What, is, what are my values in terms of right and wrong? And we wrestle... That's that's the obligation is to be willing to engage that question rather than just to 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 sort of you know fall into line and say all right I'll do whatever you know the culture wants me to do in terms of what's right and wrong and, and but so many people do that and and they either don't have the time or don't have the ability to think through it themselves so they look to what the church says they look to what uh, the government says but not the federal government only the state unless the the city council says something different. And it gets really mushy because, uh, you know, what if, what if your church says that gay marriage is wrong, but your state government says, and, that, and the party you belong to says that gay marriage is okay? That, that creates a, a conflict of, of right and wrong. Somebody, you know, if you're dealing with both the, the governmental, you're heavily into politics, you're heavily into your religion, and they're both saying... Very, very different things. What do you There do? are very personal consequences to any dogma that you subscribe to. Therefore, you must be subscribe only to your own dogma, <laughs> which must be flexible. But then you end up, you know, there are going, consequences. Going, going back to Mao or, or uh, there are uh, the Nazis. You, you but can't. the consequences for other people. If, if my consequence <clears throat> is I'm going to screw people out of their money and build a pyramid scheme and, and I get caught because it all falls apart after 25 years, uh, yeah, my consequence is jail for 120 years. And I got to pay back people. And I don't know if that ever happened, but he hurt people as, as obviously did a lot of these um, political movements. Um, where they massacred people. So you can't just say, well, if it's right for me, then I'm doing it. Again, it, goes, it has to go back to that value system, that basic value system. Is it kind? Is it helpful? Ethics is a, a method for avoiding consequences. So if you do what's right, ideally, this is the idea anyways, mm -hmm. you will avoid 
consequences. You'll be able to pass through your life without... But why do we have to have consequences? Is it because we don't want to do right? Is that why? I mean, we why do we have to have the Ten Commandments? They just are. Why, why do we have to have Ten... I mean, I know there's some things, laws, it's like, okay, well, if you have a foot in a crosswalk, then you must stop. And it's like some basic things that have to be spelled out just so everybody's on the, the, uh, the same page. But in terms of deeper values on what's admissible to do to other people, it seems people don't know. That's, that's why we get people following Paul Pot and, and I think uh, generally people do know. I think people are afraid to be their own authority. Afraid of what, though? Getting punished by the government because yes. they say... Yes. And God. Yeah. And I think, I think that is, is the obligation we have as human beings, is to wrestle with those structures of culture with those, you know, controlling systems or organizing systems. I think that's the only way that culture is advanced, is through that willingness of the individual to wrestle with that. And that means that one's own individual ideas of right and wrong are often at odds with, with the uh, controlling systems of the culture. As a father to a young woman, 13-year-old, we're f I'm faced continually with the images of females in popular culture and it's something that I have to I feel that I have the right to express this is right and this is wrong to my child to my daughter and I can tell that she respects my sense of right and wrong because I live a consistent life that is based on my deep understanding of what I feel is right and wrong when I was a boy and my father told me what was right and wrong, I had no respect for his concept of right and wrong because through my eyes he lived a, a life that was not consistent and uh, full of contradictions and lawless in many ways. The, the more you can live a life of right, the more right it's going to be. Because consistency, I think rightness is another way, another way of defining peace at heart and in mind. Uh, a life that is not full of conflict and destruction and, you know, things that we think of as counterproductive. So I am right and you are wrong. Well, but even then, I mean, your, your image of women in advertisement and stuff is different now. Your values are different because you have a young woman that you're trying to, to raise in your house. When you were 18, 19, uh, you know, through 25, you probably had a different image of, of women and, you know, and what those bikini pictures w meant to you. And it, it, it's one of those flexible value systems. It's like, why not look at a beautiful woman form but now that you have a young woman in your house, it's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe the values that you're trying to teach her are, are different than what, when your hormones were raging at 18. I don't know what to say to that. I, I think that is an interesting observation. I think it might partly be true. I mean, because I, I know in raising, raising a 13-year-old son, things that I thought were cool when I was in my early 20s, I don't want him doing or thinking about or... I ended up all right. I, I didn't turn to crime or, or uh, you know, any anything evil. But I, I just think that now that I'm I'm older, and I think, well, maybe I, I don't want him doing that kind of stuff. And not that I did anything bad, but it's just like, well, what a what a waste of time. And maybe I can direct him towards another avenue, and maybe really give him the the time and my interest and my hopefully guidance. Uh, in terms of what he wants to be as as a man, uh, then maybe he won't waste so much time doing other nonsense stuff. I'm sure I was having fun doing other stuff, and I'm not. It just seemed like I, I wasted a lot of my time in those early 20 years, just trying to figure stuff out. In those and simulations. It, maybe it took this long. I don't know. Maybe all that was necessary to get to where I am now. I don't know. Yeah. See, that's the, that's the, I think that's the main point of this for me, is that we're willing to wrestle with that. 
you're willing to wrestle with that. That's what's important. And then you come to some idea of what's right and wrong. I do believe, and maybe, it's, maybe I'm naive, but I, I do believe that if given you know, sufficient opportunity, we'll, we will align ourselves with the good and the beautiful and the right and the, you know, all of that. That is not necessarily what our culture says is right. Mm. There, there was a comedian who uh, wrote, uh, I think his name is George Patton, I forget. Um, my apologies to whoever wrote this, actually. But right after the marathon bombings in Boston, everybody was just shaking their heads trying to figure out how somebody like how somebody could do that. Patton Oswalt. Uh, Patton Oswalt, thank you. Patton Oswalt, and he wrote that uh, his father would always tell him that, uh, yeah, there's going to be evil in the world, but look, there's always somebody running to help. Look at those photos, look at that video. There's people running towards the bomb. As, as people are running away from the bomb, as, as fear and, and the stress response and survival mode kicks in, people run away from the loud explosions. But what, look at the photos, look at the video, there are people running towards the bombs to help. Yeah. And I think there's more of them than the other. It's just the other have better PR. It's more interesting uh, on the news. Um, blood cells. And so I think we hear a lot more about the well, it's the news. evil that's going going on, then yeah. you know, good news doesn't sell. News is news yeah. because it's exceptional. it's it's exceptional. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's a, it's against the norm, and you know, even the Huffington Post has a good news section on their website. The Huffington Post has a good news section, but it's buried somewhere. You have to go looking for it. It's there, but they know it doesn't. It's not the main focus of what people are going to their site for. You want to see the political arguments and the awfulness of, of the wars and going on with our country and with other countries. And so despite that fascination, I think overall the tide carries us toward, as Brad says, the good and the beautiful. And the, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Right. And I don't always know what's right and wrong. I really don't. I, I often find myself confused about what's the right thing to do. Um, the line and the consequences between right and wrong are often very small. And, mm. Well, and again, and that's, that's why I think that the genius of the, the law, the scout law, it's like, just well, filter it through this. Is it kind? Is it helpful? Yeah, is and I think that's the best if we can not, do, is to, do is to lean, lean toward the light. Uh, I don't have any big introduction for it, so let's just get rolling.